I invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 20 to 36 for our time together this morning. Uh, follow along uh, with me as I read for us John 12 verses 20 to 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. <clears throat> then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd stood there, the crowd that stood there, and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. May God bless the reading of his word. It's time for expectant parents. These words signify the arrival of something life-changing, the birth of a child. Over the years, I've heard these words several times from Helena, although I've also had to tell her it's time, uh, simply because she wasn't aware of how long, how far along she was in the birthing process. But in our passage of scripture for this morning, Jesus declares that it's time. The time of his sacrificial death on the cross had finally come. What lies ahead will be the most difficult and most glorious moment in history. But just as the pain and sacrifice of childbirth brings forth joy and new life, so also, and I think we could say in a greater way, the pain and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross brings forth joy and new life for all who believe. So look with me at verse 20. Uh, it says that there were some Greeks at uh, the Jewish feast of Passover. Uh, this was not unusual to see Greeks or, or, or Gentiles at, uh, at such a, a Jewish feast. Uh, Greeks were known for being seekers of truth. They would go through philosophy after philosophy in their search for truth. We, we get a glimpse of this in Acts chapter 17, verse 21 where it says that all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there 
would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And so as such, these Greeks find Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, and they ask to see Jesus. Philip then goes and finds Andrew, who is uh, good at bringing people to Jesus, right? He brought his brother uh, Simon Peter to Jesus in John chapter 1, and then he brought the the boy with the five loaves and two fish uh, to Jesus in in John chapter 6. And together they go and tell Jesus. Now, with the the presentation of King Jesus in in his triumphal entry, uh, which we looked at last week, and and with the world now coming to Jesus in, in the form of these Greeks, Imagine the excitement of the crowd when Jesus says to them in in verse 23, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. You see, up up to this point in John's gospel, we have seen numerous references to the fact that um, Jesus' hour, his time had not yet arrived. But here, here he announces that his hour, his time had finally arrived arrived, and not a moment too soon. The crowd quite likely has in their minds uh, the words of the prophet Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, Daniel says, I I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages would would, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Surely, they thought, Jesus is about to announce his dominion over the Romans and establish his everlasting kingdom on the earth. How disappointing then. Jesus' next words must have seemed to them. In verse 24, Jesus tells them a a parable of sorts. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The, the illustration is simple, right? A, a seed has to die in order for it to bear fruit. But of course, as with most things in the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus is talking about deeper spiritual realities here. When, when he's talking about the, the death of a seed, he's, he's talking about his death. And, and when he's talking about the, the death of a seed bearing much fruit, he's talking about how his death will mean the, the salvation of, of sinners like like these Greeks that are coming to him. In other words, Jesus would die so that others can live. As one commentator put it, uh, Jesus would take the punishment we deserve so that we can enjoy a life we do not deserve. But then Jesus expands this principle to include us, his followers. Verse 25, Jesus says, uh, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You know, just as uh, Jesus must die to bear fruit and many save sinners, so also we must experience a kind of death to bear fruit in keeping with Repentance. Right? Now, is, is Jesus saying that we must hate ourselves? You know, whoever hates his life in this world will, will keep it. Do, do we have to hate our, our lives? Do we have to hate ourselves? Of course not. It's a paradox. The Bible is full of these kinds of paradoxes. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is is made perfect in weakness, power and weakness. How, how, do, how do those things go together? Or uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Right? Humility, exaltation, how does that go together? Right? Do you want to be rich? 
then you must become poor in spirit. Do you want to be first? Then you must be willing to be last. Do you want to rule? Then you must serve. Do you want to live? Then you must die. These are, these are paradoxes. Right? Jesus isn't telling us to destroy our lives. No, he's actually telling us how to save our lives. But, but the way to saving our lives is actually by losing our lives. Uh, Jim Elliott was, uh, was an American missionary who, along with four others, uh, sought to share the gospel with the, uh, the Walrani people of Ecuador. Um, they, they were a tribe who, was, who were known for their hostility towards outsiders. Uh, many people questioned why these young men would risk their lives for this mission. Uh, but Elliot and his companions were, were driven by Christ's command to take the gospel to, to the nations, even at their own personal risk. And tragically, in 1956, they were killed by, the, by members of the very tribe that they sought to reach. Now, at first glance, this might appear like a, as, as being a, a senseless loss, a waste of a life for a dangerous cause. But El- Elliot famously wrote uh, in his journal before his death, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And this this is what Jesus means when he says that we are to to hate our lives in this world. It, it It means doing things that look foolish to the world. See, when we deny ourselves, when we take risks, when we embrace the path of suffering for the sake of Christ, it looks like we hate our lives. But what it really means is that we we actually treasure Christ above anything else in this world. This, Jesus says, is, is the path that leads to eternal life. But when our goal in life is to be safe, to be secure, to be comfortable, to be surrounded only by pleasant things, this is the path that leads to perishing. As one commentator said, we we must reject the worldliness of this world for the glories of heaven. Uh, Jesus sums it up in verse 26. If, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If we have put our trust in Jesus Christ, then we must follow Jesus. It's, it's, it's that simple. Right? Just as uh, soldiers follow their general, or as servants follow their master, or as students follow their teacher, or as sheep follow their shepherd, so also believers in Jesus must follow Jesus. There there is no wiggle room here. (laughs) It's not like we can follow him in in areas of our lives that that are convenient and then not follow him in areas of our lives that we would rather uh, remain untouched. No, following Jesus will mean surrendering control. It will mean sacrificing comfort. It will mean resisting sinful habits. It will mean prioritizing him uh, above all other human relationships. To follow Jesus is simply to live our lives for Jesus. It it means pursuing Jesus with every fiber of our being. It means being being willing to, to suffer and die just as Jesus would suffer and die. But notice the promise that Jesus holds out to those who follow him. At the end of verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. There there is a great reward that comes from taking our attention off of ourselves, off of our situations, off of our comforts, off of our well-being, off of our our everything about us and focusing exclusively on Christ. 
If we want to find joy in our lives, then we must die to ourselves. We must die to safety. We must die to security. We must die to comfort. We must die to protecting our reputation. We must die to selfishness. We must die to to self-centeredness. Only when we die can we truly live. That's what Jesus is saying. And Jesus models this in his own death. And as as such, Jesus pauses here to reflect on his approaching death. In verse 27, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. Jesus knows that the crucifixion is imminent. And he's overwhelmed with emotion. Such a response may seem startling to us in light of who he is. Right? Yes, Jesus was and is truly man. He experienced hunger. He experienced weariness. He experienced sadness and and anger and joy, just as we do, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says. But Jesus was and is also truly God. He is the one who holds the world together. He is the one who healed lepers with a touch. He is the one who cast out demons with a word. He is the one who walked right through the crowd that was intent on killing him. Yet we find him in this moment deeply troubled with what was to come. Now, we must be clear here uh, that it is not merely the agony of crucifixion that has Jesus in great turmoil. Certainly, crucifixion was a horrific way to die. Right? Jesus' uh, flayed back would be pressed against an uneven piece of wood. The nails would be pierced through the, the nerves in his wrists. He would be constantly struggling to get a breath. But if that were all that Jesus feared, then we would be doing him an injustice. For there have been other men who have suffered more agonizing deaths than that. In other words, if it was only physical pain that Jesus was facing, then he would have received it willingly. But the agony that Jesus is experiencing was knowing that he would bear the penalty for the sins of the world as the sinless son of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. His soul, which had never been tainted with sin, would instantly have the sins of the world poured upon it. Jesus would take upon himself the curse that our sin demanded. As Galatians 3 verse 13 puts it, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He he would endure the full fury of God's wrath toward sin. For the first and only time, the perfect fellowship that existed between father and son would be torn apart so that Jesus in deep anguish on the cross would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what has Jesus troubled in his soul. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would say to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, Mark 14, verse 34 says. And Luke records that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground, Luke 22, verse 44 says. 
Here we see the heart of Christ as he anticipated the horror of the cross. So if your soul is troubled, look to Christ who endured such agony for our salvation. If you're going through trials of various kinds, whether uh, the death of a loved one or or a a painful marital uh, relationship, feelings of worthlessness or uncertainty about the future, wow, pressing to us, look To Jesus. He bore your pain. He bore your sorrow. He bore your heartache on the cross so that you could have his peace. Notice too how Jesus responds to the turmoil he is facing in verse 27 says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? There's no way that Jesus is going to turn away from the cross. The cross was was his destiny. Instead, Jesus says, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. See, the ultimate reason Jesus came to earth was for the Father's glory. The cross is not first about us. We are, of course, glad recipients of what was accomplished on our behalf, but we are not first the focus. Jesus is saying to his Father, Give me the cross. Give me the agony. Give me the suffering. Give me the the separation from you so that you will get the glory. That's Jesus' motivation. His, His ultimate reason for coming to earth and suffering and dying on the cross on our behalf is so that God would get the glory. Imagine what it would look like if we were committed to the glory of God like Jesus was. Imagine if we lived in such a way that every aspect of our lives, our words, our actions, our relationships, our our goals, our struggles, everything pointed others to the greatness and goodness of God. Imagine if we went from living for ourselves to living for the for the honor and fame of our Savior. God is worthy of our praise and affection. Do our lives reflect that? Immediately, a voice came from heaven. I've glorified it. That is, uh, God has glorified his name. And he says, I will glorify it again. This is the only time in the Gospel of John that God speaks audibly. But what's interesting is that only Jesus can actually understand what God says. And and it's yet another example of how these people do not have eyes to see or ears to hear. You know, while they rightly conclude that the the thunder they're hearing is of heavenly origin, they, they still refuse to believe in Jesus. And so Jesus then gives them three effects of the cross. Three effects of the cross. First, at the cross, God demonstrated his justice. God would demonstrate his justice. In verse 31, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. The the reality is that uh, you and I have sinned against an infinitely holy God. 
We, we have committed cosmic treason against the king of the universe, and our sin debt must be paid. Right? God would be a wicked judge if he, if he simply excused wickedness and sin. No, no, our sin debt must be paid, but here's the problem. There, there is no way for us to pay it. But here's the good news. The, God has judged our sins by executing justice on Jesus. At the cross, Jesus took the punishment for sin we deserve so that through faith in Jesus, we can actually stand before an infinitely holy God, blameless, because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, the bad news for for those who, who reject Jesus is that the cross has sealed their fate. Now is the judgment of this world, right? Their their rejection of God's perfect sacrifice means they will have to bear sin's penalty themselves, which will mean eternity in hell. So notice the ramifications, right? At the cross, God... God would demonstrate his justice. Secondly, at the cross, Satan would be defeated. Satan would be defeated. In verse 31, Jesus says, now will the ruler of this world be cast out. You know, from from a worldly perspective, the cross looks like the defeat of Jesus and a victory for Satan. But the cross has actually sealed Satan's defeat. Uh, According to the, the promise of God to Adam and Eve, the serpent would indeed bruise Jesus' heel. Right? He would die. But Jesus would also crush the serpent's head. Because when, when Jesus rose from the dead, he would liberate us. He would free us from the grip of Satan. So we see God, God would demonstrate his justice. Uh, Satan would be defeated. And thirdly, at the cross, Jesus would reconcile sinners to God. Jesus would reconcile sinners to to God. In verse 32, Jesus says, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And as Jesus is on the cross, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of of socioeconomic status, Jesus would draw all people to himself. Right? Now, Jesus is not saying that, um, that, that the whole world would be saved, but that all who would be saved would be saved by looking to Jesus Christ alone. Right? Entertainment does not draw people to Christ. Watered down or, or feel-good messages do not draw people to Christ. Moralism or, or behavioral modification does not draw people to Christ. Theological liberalism and and the denial of core doctrines in Christianity does not draw people to Christ. Social justice does not draw people to Christ. What draws people to Christ is Christ. What draws people to Christ is is his death and resurrection. And if you are not a believer in Jesus, his arms are open. He is ready to receive you. You just need to look to Christ. Look at his troubled soul as he became a curse for you. As he suffered separation from his father for you. As he lovingly bore the penalty of your sins for you. Look to Christ and live. Look to Christ and see his love for you. There's a, a story about a little boy uh, who wanted a model sailboat. And so he began saving his money until he finally had enough. Uh, he went to the toy shop and he picked out his kit and he made his selection with great care. And they spent weeks perfecting that boat until finally it was finished. He took it down to the lake, and it sailed beautifully, right across the lake and out of sight. 
Now, naturally, this boy was distressed and began a frantic search, but despite his efforts, he was unable to find this boat. Several weeks later, he was walking past a store window, and to his amazement, he saw his boat with a sizable price tag attached to it. He went in, he told the owner, Sir, I would like to have my boat back. The owner said, Well, I'm sorry, but I paid good money for it. You will have to pay for it. The boy worked and worked until finally he got enough money together again, and he bought his boat back. As he walked out of the store, he said, Now you are twice mine. Once because I made you, and once because I bought you. Now, of course, we can draw the connection to, to Jesus. Right? He created us, and he has purchased us by his death on the cross. So that he could say, we are twice his. Now, despite this love for his, his creatures, they still refuse to believe in him. In verse 34, the crowd says to, to Jesus, you know, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that, that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man, right? They're just throwing arguments to the wind now. It, it's simply that they anticipated a triumphant Messiah, but Jesus is speaking of a, of a suffering Messiah. They refused to believe in a Messiah that would die. Now, had they read their Bibles, they, they would have had a fuller, richer picture of Christ. Right? They had overlooked passages of Scripture like Isaiah 53, which speaks of a, of a suffering servant who would bear the sins of many. Right? They had overlooked Psalm 22, which describes intense suffering and rejection. And as such, they miss Jesus. Jesus responds with one more appeal to believe in him. Verses 35 to 36, Jesus says, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Do you see the appeal? Jesus is begging us to come out of the darkness of sin and death and the clutches of Satan and hell and to come into his light. That's the appeal. And the, and the last part of verse 36 is significant. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and he hid himself from them. The, Jesus will not appear publicly again, until his arrest. And so Jesus is essentially giving them one last chance to believe in him before it's too late. And the same may be true for, for us if we have not believed. The same choice that was before the, the crowd in Jesus' day is the same choice that is before each one of us this morning. Will we choose life or will we choose death? Will we choose light or will we choose darkness? Will we choose Jesus? Or will we choose any manner of lesser things? The choice is ours. Which will we choose? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly laid down his life so that we might have life. You have called us to follow you wherever you go, and to live not for ourselves, but for your glory. Lord, help us to place our trust completely in you. Teach us what it means to die to ourselves so that your life and your light may be clearly seen in us. Help us to live with our eyes fixed on you, knowing that the cost is worth it 
for the sake of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us and who now reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.